we really are focusing on the primary mechanisms of action, but really taking a step back to look at what exactly it is that our antipsychotic medications um, are doing. So objectives for today, we're gonna identify some of the uh, most common pharmacologic targets. Full disclosure, it is not all of the receptor profiles for all of the medications. Um, it was a little hard to focus those in, but we're gonna stick with, with the main ones. We're gonna look at the proposed therapeutic actions as well as the adverse effect profiles. So recognizing sometimes the action is what we're desiring and other times it may be causing effects that weren't necessarily intended. Just to ensure everybody is on the same page, I wanted to look at a definition of pharmacodynamics. So pharmacodynamics is a branch of pharmacology dealing with the reactions between drugs and living systems. Um, that's from Miriam Webster. What we tell most of the pharmacy students is that pharmacodynamics are what the drug does to the body, um, whereas pharmacokinetics would be the other side, and that's really what the body is doing to the drug, how it's able to um, process it and get rid of it. So what the drug does to the body, we have a whole list of antipsychotic medications um, that started coming out in the 1950s with the discovery of chlorpromazine, um, that it really seemed to be causing a, a nice sedation effect and taking the edge off, and it really has exploded since then. Um, up through the um, most recent time in the last two to three years where we've had a couple other agents um, that have been approved. Interestingly, in the pipeline, there are some other agents, but we're very likely to see a movement away from the dopaminergic agents, which are the majority that we see here on the screen, um, toward looking at some other novel mechanisms of action. For this, I, the clearest way I could think to separate these is our first generation and second generation. So all those that are within the big green rectangle, we're gonna focus on first. And these are our first generation antipsychotics, so the medications that were approved early, earlier on. They tend to be described based on potency, um, high potency to low potency. Um, one of the ways that we traditionally have looked at comparing the different antipsychotic medications is based on their dosing. Um, so with the first generation, we use chlorpromazine equivalents. So how much of each medication would be equal to 100 milligrams of chlorpromazine? More recently, there has been a movement away from that to look at other models of equivalency. One of the models that's been used is um, the defined daily dose. So I'm gonna use my notes for this one. This came from the World Health Organization. So they have identified the defined daily dose as the maintenance average dose for the treatment of psychosis in adults. And they did that based on one milligram of olanzapine. You'll actually be able to find evaluations for one milligram of risperidone or compared to one milligram of aripiprazole as well. But they're really looking to find other ways of, of seeing what would be equivalent um, between the, the different medication classes. So this is the, um, the olanzapine equivalents. And what you'll see is there's a relatively broad um, range that still exists regardless of which equivalency that you use. I wanted to put that in place because I'm going to make some general statements looking at pharmacology, but I want you to recognize there is quite a bit of variability within there, even though most of them act the same way. So our primary actions of the first generation are the antagonism of the dopamine 2 receptor. Um, so we're blocking that dopamine 2 receptor, the, the brownish triangle there on the bottom. Um, and then some of the other main mechanisms of action for the first generation are antagonism of the muscarinic receptors, the histaminic receptors, as well as our noradrenergic receptors, that alpha-1 receptor up there. So the good news is the dopamine 2 blockade is really kind of what we want um, to get rid of some of the psychotic symptoms, but it also comes with a price. There's uh, quite a few different dopaminergic pathways and we're not able to block just one. So part of it's therapeutic and part of it is gonna contribute to our adverse effects. For a number of the other receptor profiles that are up there, we've identified them traditionally as really being part of the adverse effect profile. So histamine blockade, looking at sedation and weight gain, muscarinic blockade, looking at our anticholinergic adverse effects, there's quite a bit of interest in looking at what other role does histamine and acetylcholine play. 
So are they involved in executive functioning and cognition? Might they play other roles other than just the adverse effects? And that's really where we're still, still struggling to get information as we don't understand all of the inner workings. The noradrenergic receptor, our alpha one that's up there, has traditionally been identified as causing trouble with maybe dizziness and orthostatic hypotension. Um, so your blood pressure getting low when you stand up from a seated or laying position. Um, and that one still is a little bit more on the adverse effect profile, but they're looking at what other roles norepinephrine might play because dopamine doesn't work on its own. It's kind of in a chemical soup in the brain. And we're just starting to be able to have the technology to, pu to pull those apart and look at the other layers. So focusing on the dopamine pathways, as this is our main focus for the pharmacology, the mechanism of action, we have four different dopaminergic pathways. The mesolimbic pathway, uh, I'm sorry, the negrostriatal pathways are number one, and that one really is um, much more predominantly associated with movement disorders, so our extra param pyramidal side effects. Number two is our mesolimbic pathway. This is where we see a lot of the positive symptoms of psychosis, so things like hallucinations. Mesocortical pathway has been associated with some of the negative symptoms, um, potentially higher executive functioning, emotional response, cognition, and also it may play a little bit of a role with some of the other adverse effects that we see, things like akathisia. And then the last is our tubero infundibular pathway, and this is our prolactin pathway. So when we block dopamine in that pathway, we actually see the elevated levels of prolactin. Now, because we see the different, the four different pathways that we have, um, the amount of inhibition, the amount of blockade that we have in each pathway really will contribute to the amount of adverse effects that we have. And even though all of these agents are considered first-generation antipsychotics, we do see a degree of variability between them. So I gave you on this chart um, looking at high sedation, so a lot more of, of potentially that uh, anticholinergic or antihistaminic action um, for chlorpromazine, whereas haloperidol won't have that quite as much. So it's, it really is a little bit of a guessing game being able to tailor the adverse effects to your patient. Um, it may be beneficial to have something that's sedating because they do have difficulty sleeping, or it may make it difficult for them to be able to engage in anything because they really don't, um, they aren't able to be as cognitively um, engaged and attentive as they would like to be. One of the other points I would like to make on this slide in particular is on the far right-hand side. Um, so weight gain, there is weight gain associated with our first generation. We traditionally think of it with our second generation. It wasn't one of the largest issues. Um, the movement disorders were really the focus of, of the problematic side effects that we saw with, with these agents, but it does exist. So it's not that it would be negligible weight gain, there still is a risk even with these agents, and we're beginning to gain more and more information as to how they actually compare. Um, so as you'll see, there's quite a few of them that do have some moderate amounts of weight gain, which means at least 10% of those individuals um, who've been on this medication have been reported to gain some weight. Although the amount of weight gain seems to vary. So with our first generation, where we were really focused on the dopamine. As we move to our second generation agents, we're gonna look both at the dopamine as well as at the serotonin. I, um, for the second generation antipsychotics, there is some degree of variability in the chlorpromazine equivalents. Um, a lot of the focus, especially with some of the newer agents, has been looking at them in the equivalence of the defined daily dose. Um, so that's this um, chart that's listed here. I apologize, I really searched for the iloperidone, the brexpiprazole, and the cariprazine, and I was unable to find um, information about dosing equivalents from them in any type of format. Um, so they're new enough that they really haven't been incorporated just yet. Um, I'm hoping that the next round of, of reviews and analysis that comes out now that we've gotten more data on them will include them, but they, they weren't in there just yet. So for our second generation, 
we are looking at expanding those mechanisms of action just a little bit. Um, each of these agents really is unique unto itself. I have two examples up here with the olanzapine and the zeprazidone to see that there are a number of other receptors um, that are in play. We're gonna focus on some of the, um, the more common ones or the ones that are a little bit better understood as to what their actions may be. So we still have the dopamine antagonism, but we also have a couple partial agonists. So our aripiprazole and our brexpiprazole. So meaning that, yep, they'll block um, the dopamine receptors if there's too much dopamine, but if there's not a lot of dopamine in those pathways, they may actually increase the amount of dopaminergic tone that, are, that exists there. The histamine, muscarinic, and noradrenergic, very familiar from what we saw with the first generation agents, and the serotonergic antagonisms for 2A and 2C at the end are really our other new focus. So with the dopamine, we are still blocking the dopaminergic receptors um, or attenuating them with the partial agonists in all four of these pathways. Um, but because we had some difficulty, especially with movement disorders with the first generation, it was hoped that we'd be able to tailor those effects a little bit more. And that's really where the role of serotonin comes in. I could not find an uncopyrighted picture, um, so I had to use shapes as best I could. So we have our blue dopaminergic neuron. So on those dopamine neurons, they may have a bunch of other receptors on them. In this case, I use the um, serotonin 2A receptor. So postsynaptically, it sits on those dopamine receptors. When serotonin attaches to it, it'll reduce the amount of dopamine that's released. So by blocking that receptor, we actually could get an increased release in dopamine in that pathway. So it creates an interesting balance with having more dopamine release, even though there's a little bit of dopamine blockade from, that, from the antipsychotic. What this is proposed to be able to do is assist with some of the movement disorders. So especially in the Negro striatal pathway, by having a little bit more of the dopamine put back, we see a reduced incidence of the extra parameter side effects with the second generation agents. It also is proposed to do this in the mesocortical pathway. So by blocking dopamine there, it may actually make the emotional blunting or some of the cognitive effects a little bit more prominent. By having some of the 5-HT2A blockade, you can put a little bit more of the dopamine back in there. The thought is maybe it could have a larger impact on the negative symptoms. While that was what was proposed, what the evidence has shown is there is a little bit more activity there, although it's not as robust as what was originally um, hoped for. The other place that these serotonin receptors may really play a role is as receptors on other neurons. So they're looking a lot at glutamatergic neurons, so our glutamate neurons. So potentially by turning off some of the glutamate neurons, we can change how the rest of the neurons function. So maybe it reduces overactivation in the mesolimbic pathway to help with the positive symptoms. Maybe it turns off the negative, um, the, the GABA neurons, which are causing inhibition in some of the other pathways. So they're really looking at how this may be a signaling mechanism and the larger implications that it could have. There is a tremendous amount of variability within this class of, of agents. I wanted to give you a brief comparison. These tend to link up with the types of receptors that each of the individual medications um, interact with. It's just a comparison. It's based on the, the incidence um, of each of these adverse effects. So from the movement disorders, you're looking at less than 15%. For the one plus, 15 to 30% for the two plus, and over 30% for the three plus. I think one of the things that also is very challenging is the fact that even though it, a medication may not look like it's very commonly causing the side effect, it still can, and it can be a very robust response, especially in the weight gain category for some of the patients. So, this is uh, an area of, of a lot of intense research, especially looking at the pharmacogenomic profile, to try to pick out who those high risk patients might be. So, to wrap up, this was our quick transition through pharmacodynamics of antipsychotics.
So they do work on a variety of neurotransmitters. Our focus has been on dopamine and serotonin up to this point, but we're really exploring the role that some of these other agents play. We have a desired therapeutic effect, but we really need to balance that with the adverse effects, both acutely and chronically. And that individual variability makes it continually challenging, but it's a great opportunity to be able to continue to um, network and engage with your patient to make sure you're up to speed with what's going on with them. They may tolerate it at first, but other adverse effects may come up later. So it's a great way to continue to do that check-in and evaluation.